Greetings, I'm John A. Freeman, and this is For Fair's Sake. We must now perform the form of Marlowe's fortunes, good or bad. To patient judgments, we appeal our plaud. In addressing what has been referred to as the Marlowe Bacon problem, first, we'll look more closely at who Marlowe really was, why he wasn't actually the author of the plays ascribed him, and why he definitely wasn't Shakespeare. Then, with the help of Lord Bacon and his Knights of the Helmet, we will suggest a new way of examining the birth of the English Renaissance in literature, how the stage was set amongst sacred circles, inspirations, and masks. We'll use the key text of Dr. Faustus and the German connection to illustrate this problem and mystery, to help break through what Lawrence Gerald calls 400 years of Stratfordian tyranny. As Wim Hof would ask, let's go deep. Hope you'll stick with us. There is such profit and delight in this research. It's Faustian in a good way. First of all, Simon Miles, in the minds of research, finding the nuggets of gold lying around, left by alchemists waiting to be picked up. Articles of the Sir Francis Bacon Society's Baconiana, which as President Susan McIlroy will testify, bears a long list of authors with unsurpassable knowledge of the field. The Shakespeare Handbook on Dr. Faustus, a great resource, which funnily enough has Stratfordian Paul Edmondson, or Edmo the Glove, as one of the series editors. According to Guy Roberts of the Prague Shakespeare Company, not only did Shakespeare write Shakespeare, but he was writing in the midst of a theatrical explosion and was mostly just the right guy at the right time. Guy is what we'd call a chevral man, only able to provide a rather flaccid piece of evidence, the aforementioned Edmondson's Feste's glove reference to settle the authorship question. This also goes hand in hand with a reductionist, money-making explanation as to why Shakespeare's theatre was so revolutionary. But shifts like these, they don't just happen out of nowhere. They require an impulse much like the Renaissance, starting at a point, then spreading out into the world. Robert Weinman in 1978 said that Marlowe transformed the materials of medieval drama into the new form of Renaissance tragedy. But was the man Marlowe capable of something this big or was something bigger going on? There is mystery within Marlowe and Shakespeare by design. To begin, Let's make two vital acknowledgements in tracing the origins of the magic. The figure of John Dee represents a coming together of occult, things hidden and mysterious, and Christian beliefs. He was tutor to Leicester, advisor and court astrologer to Elizabeth. Some said it was the Majesty Dee himself who conjured the storm and destroyed the Spanish fleet in 1588. Francis Yates calls the Tempest a Rosicrucian manifesto infused with the spirit of Dee, using theatrical parables for esoteric communication. He's known to have travelled in Germany and to have influenced other Englishmen who travelled abroad. He was also instrumental in the creation of Elizabethan theatre. James Burbage consulted with Dee on architecture and theatre arts using his extensive library on classical Greek and Roman theatre. These spaces were the first purpose-built sacred structures lit by daylight since Roman times. This is important. A cultural sea change occurred with this simple but brilliant idea of having the punters come to the drama. At the liberties, oi, oi, oi. Where 15 to 20,000 Londoners would see a play every week, all strata of society together under one roof, a new form of temple to rebuild the temple of the mind. The meaning behind Dee's esoteric symbol, Monus Hieroglyphica, was for those who are worthy as with Shakespeare, multiple layers of language and imagery are deployed, accessible to various levels of reader. 
The authorship issue may not matter to some. Others are content with the mask. But as Costard says, <laughs> Thrice three is nine. Not so, sir. We know what we know. Some of us revel in the mystery and engage in the language of symbols and ideas used for the unlocking of ancient knowledge. We must also consider the involvement of a wider organisation, the Rosa Cross Fraternity, who we believe helped finance, produce and protect the operation. Francis Bacon's Knights of the Helmet were a signification of this network of intellectuals throughout Europe, a hidden group of writers and artists, bright minds in dark times, who sought to weave ancient wisdom into their work in order to transform the culture. At this time, if you dared mention alchemy, astrology, astronomy, magic, number mysticism, divination, or other esoteric sciences rooted in the ancient world, you are putting your life at risk. Giordano Bruno, an erudite priest and well-traveled scholar, returning to Italy in 1592, was arrested, imprisoned, and finally burnt at the stake in 1600 for such ideas. The Rosicrucians emerged before the public with the publication of three manifestos. The first, printed in Kaffel in 1614, was anonymously published, the authors preferring not to be toast, with a subtext of political intrigue and revealing the existence of a secret fraternity. Formed in Germany, it possessed the great secrets of the universe, alchemy, magic, medicine and wisdom, as discovered by their founder, CRC, on his journey to the Holy Land. In offering a path to all things that can be known by man under heaven, this was revolution. The Rosicrucians took fault with the pride and covetousness of the learned, scholars more concerned with personal success than entrusting their abilities to the service of humanity like much of scholarship today, clinging to prevailing entrenched paradigms to protect careers, book sales and egos, rather than questioning and disrupting them. A.D. Wright demonstrates how Marlowe was influenced by Giordano Bruno and a concept central to his theology. God as pure divinity, which also embraced the hermetic principle of man as potentially divine through the power of his intellect. Such influences on Renaissance free thinkers labelled them as atheists. Bruno was actually a dedicated religious magician who practised good magic in the discovery of divine and scientific truth. All this is a million miles away from the obscene anti-Christian blasphemies cited by Paul H. Cocker as being Marlowe's opinions, but surely there are echoes of Bruno's voice heard in Faustus' passionate cry, "'Tis magic, magic that hath ravished me." Yeats asserts that Dee's hermetic, cabalistic magic is the more secret philosophy which lies behind the enigmatic manifestos. She also holds magical philosophy to be the precursor to the scientific revolution. It is the Renaissance magus who exemplifies that changed attitude of man to the cosmos, which was the necessary preliminary to the use of science. Who was also known as Marloe. Or oh, Merlin, Morle, Marle, Marloe, Marlin, Marlin. Or Marlin, which seems is how it was written more often than not. As the Shakespeare handbooks tell us, Marlowe plays with their subversive and aspiring heroes are inevitably read alongside of what we know of the poet's own short and stormy life. But who was Christopher Marlowe? This slide lists just about everything, by and large, that is known about him historically. He was the son of a shoemaker, but well-educated at the King's School. In 1580, at 16, he was entered at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, the name Marlin being written without prefix or affix, 
A gentleman of the college once remarked that scholars were entered with a pomp and circumstance not found in the notice of Marlin. He was therefore not a scholar. Nevertheless, in 1583, he obtained his BA. He finds a job in the Secret Service, working for Francis Walsingham, and goes to France, ferreting out Catholic plotters against the Queen. On this account, Marlowe seems to have had some acquaintance with certain distinguished men of his time. He's accused of being a double agent and nearly doesn't get his masters from Cambridge, but the Privy Council sends a letter referring to his service on matters touching the benefit of the country. And the degree is granted in 1587. A.H. Bullen says there is nothing whatsoever to show that Marlowe was distinguished for industry at school. It may be safely said that the poet could not have earned much distinction at Cambridge for sound classical knowledge. How were the years after 1583 spent? With no reliable evidence, it's impossible to determine. But Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham <laughs> is obliged to assume for certain that a still greater part of it must have been passed in a diligent cultivation of the muses. In order to account for the early appearance of Tamburlaine the Great, an astonishing drama performed in London as early as 1587. A street brawler a coin forger, an atheist. His death in Deptford in 1593, aged 29, has provoked years of speculation. That he knew William Shakespeare, there is no proof. And yet Professor David Riggs, the latest word of authority, says that for his peers, Marlowe's great achievements were an English blank verse line that stood up to Virgil's stately measure and a rhymed English couplet that reproduced the elegance and wit of Ovid's love poetry. Is all this just slightly incongruous? As Bertrand Theobald tells us, we can hardly be certain of anything in respect to his education and early life, still less of his later life. All the facts relating to texts are puzzling and even contradictory. We cannot fit the works to the man. The man is practically unknown to us. It does seem that Marlowe had several run-ins with the authorities, though, with various scandalous opinions and behaviours attributed to him. Another apparent double agent, Richard Baines, accused Marlowe of heresy, blasphemy and homosexuality. <laughs> Was it true? Who knows? While under investigation for heresy, the story we all know is that Marlowe spent a day boozing at a tavern in Deptford in the company of three barflies. These men were actually all associated with the Elizabethan Secret Service. And the tavern was the home of Dame Eleanor Bull, who had courtly connections and hired out her rooms as a safe house for government agents. Here's what happened. An argument about the bill got so aggro, Marlowe grabbed old mate Ingram Frizz's knife and went into a stabbing frenzy round his head. So the Frizz grabs the dagger and drives it into Marlowe's head, right above the right eye. Death was instantaneous. Frizzer was pardoned by the Queen and the episode of Marlowe's death, much augmented, and distorted became a moral exemplum of the dangers of atheism. We even get a merging of Marlowe and Faustus in Thomas Beard's The Theatre of God's Judgments. Marlin, by profession a scholar brought up from his youth in the University of Cambridge, but by practice a playmaker and a poet of scurrility, who by giving too large a swing to his own wit and suffering his lust to have the full reins fell, not without just desert, to the outrage and extremity that he denied God and his son Christ. There is no proof that Marlowe was an author, except in name and on posthumously dated title pages. Yet how easily a narrative can be constructed, especially in the cloudy rear mirror 
and how advantageously, as we shall see for the Shakespeare circle. The renegades were safer if they were already dead. R.M. Theobald's 1905 examination of Mr. J. Ingram's book on Marlowe offers stern proof that the whole method of Elizabethan criticism requires revision. The credit of high rank in the authorship field doesn't seem to depend on poetic insight, a grasp of historical fact, or even large views of the aims and purposes of literary creation. As with the Strats and the Oxfos, Marlovians have a propensity to fill in all the lacunae of history and biography with unlimited guessing and copious speculation. Conjectures and fancies are built up of necessity as the plain fact is, there is no material available for the purpose. Folk like the Lieutenant Colonel assume that Marlowe had ability and industry and precocity of intellect, not because there is documentary evidence for this, but because the works to which Marlowe's name are attached suggest it. It's not true to assume that university men were, as a rule, gentlemen or scholars. They were a rough set including a large proportion of idle, ignorant, beer-drinking men, fond of high jinks and vulgar sports, finding little or no profit by their residence in the university, able to obtain a degree and yet remain ignorant, rude and disorderly. There is no evidence that Marlowe or Will Shakespeare were ever seriously engaged in the realms of philosophy, classics or science. There are also significant indications that the poems and plays attributed to Marlowe cannot be entirely his, or his at all. Natch, this is ignored by Ingram, who presents Marlowe's notoriety and popularity as a well-ascertained fact. Even if the poems and plays were at once recognised as productions of the highest genius, there is not an atom of proof that Marlowe was identified as that genius. Before Marlowe's death, only Tamburlaine had been published anonymously. All the rest are posthumous attributions. The evidence of title pages, publishers, dedications and prefaces are sufficient evidence for Team Ingram, while the more well-informed will know that nothing is more open to suspicion and challenge. Faustus, for example, cannot have been written by Marlowe. It was entered at Stationers Hall in 1601 and published in 1604. A slightly altered version was published in 1609, but in 1616, 23 years after the death of its reputed author, another edition appeared, enlarged by half as much again. Ingram and Kind will call these degrading interpolations or corruptions, which they are not. The new matter is of the same quality and evidently by the same workman. And that workman certainly wasn't Marlowe. What could Marlowe know, for example, about the persecutions of Bruno, which did not occur until eight or nine years after his death? The only rescue from this critical writing and destructiveness, this reign of literary phrenesis, Theobald tells us, is a frank admission that the question must be approached in a different way. We must appeal to Francis Bacon to shed light on these dark places and lift the floundering critics out of their quandary. The crucial mystery at the heart of the Shakespeare problem, it seems to Simon Miles, is the exact nature of the relationship between Shakespeare, Marlowe and Francis Bacon. If Bacon wrote Shakespeare and plays like Tamburlaine and Faustus were written by who we believe was Marlowe, Bacon must have known, worked with and highly respected this figure. But are we to imagine that Bacon as Shakespeare took over the ideas, forms and theatrical skills that Marlowe had devised and developed, as he is said by many critics to have done? How would this square with the idea of Bacon as a universal and unique genius? To investigate these problems, we need to take a look at the circumstances surrounding the first appearance of these names, 
Marlowe and Shakespeare in connection with writing for the theatre. Parker Woodward's Tudor Problems from 1925 lends a hand. In London, a complete unbroken series of history plays on the English monarchy appeared between 1591 and 1600 on stage and in print in quarto editions, all appearing anonymously, except curiously for a period of two years, 1593 to 1594. Who was coordinating all this? Shakespeare appears out of nowhere with plays later attributed to him starting from the early 1590s. He seems to have learned and assimilated all of the lessons of those before him, showing a mastery of many tricks and skills developed and honed by these other writers, taking them to a whole new level. Meanwhile, as it happens, the other authors soon die or fade away. The Elizabethan stage arose in a period of less than 20 years from an almost complete vacuum into a body of work unparalleled in the history of literature, art and culture. Let's wind back the clock to June 1st, 1593. Christopher Marlowe died yesterday. His inquest is taking place. This slide shows all of the works later ascribed to either Marlowe or Shakespeare which had appeared up until this date. Despite the existence of all these works, in not one single instance had the name of Christopher Marlowe or William Shakespeare appeared in any format whatsoever in connection with writing for the theatre or poetry. Neither had anyone referred to either of them by name in any letters, notebooks, records of performances and payments, advertisements, reviews, books or pamphlets. Staggering facts, folks! So just what was the relationship between Shakespeare and Marlowe? They left a huge footprint, but no trace of an identifying mark. How? Why? Shedding some light, Miles provides two incredible pieces of information. First, the remainder of a lost poem called the Dutch Churchyard Libel, or DCL, found in a sheaf of papers for auction at Christie's in 1971, signed Per Tamberlane, or by Tamberlane. If Marlowe the Man was known as Marlowe the Playwright in 1593, why then, when he was hauled before the Privy Council to answer charges regarding the heretical papers found in Thomas Kidd's home, was he not questioned about this poem? The DCL was their main concern and they'd authorised any means necessary up to and including torture to get to the bottom of the authorship. And here in front of them was the man who'd written the very hit of the 1591 season. Professor Clifford Leach says with the production of Tamburlaine, Marlowe received recognition and acclaim and playwriting became his major concern in the few years that lay ahead. Yet at no point was Marlowe suspected or accused in any way of involvement in the DCL affair, which proves that they did not think of the man Marlowe as the author of the play. These events intruded on the London literary universe and led to the very first appearance of the name of Marlowe specifically in connection with the theatre. By the way, have a look-see at the first page of Tamburlaine, printed in 1590, prominently marked with an FB. Second, Thomas Kidd, who was actually a scrivener, took centre stage at the height of the DCL drama. Soon after being arrested and tortured, he wrote two letters to the Lord Keeper. These letters are highly significant, as one contains a reference on which the entire myth of Marlowe has been built. Kidd tells us that the service rendered to an unnamed protected lord by Marlowe consisted in bearing name, not in relation to any aspect of the lord's life except the matter of writing for his players. A man can hardly be said to perform a service to another man with the act of putting his own names on his own plays. So what could this mean except that he'd been contracted to allow the plays to bear his name? That was the service, that and only that. It's so obvious that only four centuries of conditioning can stop a man from seeing it. For whatever reason, this Lord wrote plays but did not want his name appearing on them. While anonymity was one resolution to this dilemma, 
having an alternative pen name as a cover was a more secure long-term strategy. Accordingly, the Lord had entered into a contractual relationship with Marlowe for the right to use his name. As of May 30th, 1593, this right had been purchased but not exercised. With Parker Woodward, Miles suggests and proves that the unnamed Lord was Francis Bacon. Looking at Marlowe's poetry and his translation of Ovid's elegies, Miles examines the curious difference between the Marlowe and B.I. versions of Elegy 15, the second a variation on the first. Ben Johnson has Ovid Jr. recite this poem in the Poetista, a character clearly fashioned on Francis Bacon. When Venus and Adonis was published, publicly launching the writing career of William Shakespeare, his name did not appear on the front cover. Instead, a couplet was chosen to occupy the privileged position beneath the title of his debut work, the couplet from Elegy 15, We Just Met. For more than a decade, Rick Wagner has been convinced that the man we assume to have written the works of Christopher Marlowe was actually a front man, in the same way that Chuck Spare was. Critics have always found great difficulty in accounting for the high level of achievement in the earliest Shakespeare plays. When and where did Shakespeare try his prentice hand? The answer is that the same author wrote under the pen names of Green, Peel and Marlowe. So let's fill in the rest of the timeline of history plays with this in mind. Having gained his experience in these early works, after the death of Marlowe, Bacon and his circle blossomed forth into the full glory of Shakespeare. Contestants have included William Shakespeare. Face like a butcher. Edward de Vere. Flatulent face. <laughs> oh. And now, Christopher Marlowe. Tobacco and boys. Face. Yeah. T. Wright critiques Calvin Hoffman's 1955 assertion that it was Christopher Marlowe, without any collaboration with any other writer who was the playwright Shakespeare. Hoff says it is probable that even before Marlowe was awarded his BA, he had written, in his 19th and 20th years, most of the plays that bear his name. You might think that Marlowe's early death before most of the Shakespeare plays had appeared would be an obstacle for Hoff, but no. Marlowe was not murdered at Deptford. He was resurrected and with the aid of Walsingham, spirited away to Italy, where he continued to write the plays, which he sent back to Walsingham. Uh, like the Oxfos, this shit gives us anti-strats a bad name. Mr. Hoffman's belief is based entirely on the occurrence of resemblances of phrases, expressions and lines, which he found were common to both Marlowe and Shakespeare. Just like in 2016. Marlowe receives a credit as co-writer of the three Henry VII plays. Scholarship and 21st century computerized tools show Shakespeare's collaboration with other playwrights was far more extensive than has been realized. Until now. But such resemblances are to be found in profusion and with equal significance in the works of other writers of the same period. The works which we've seen were then anonymous, but later ascribed to different authors. Let's turn now to Faustus. Good people, this is not a tale of wars, of guns and trumpets, charges, victories, nor is it a melting love romance with dainty dalliance on rich divans. No, we are here to tell you the strange story of John Faustus, born poor in Germany, a brilliant boy who made his way to college, studied in Wittenberg, amazed his masters by scaling the heights of theology and science and graduating as a doctor of renown. Not the world, but the universe was his oyster. What would he do? What could he not do? 
watch and listen as his mind is set to soar into far regions unexplored before. This story of a man who sells his soul for knowledge and power has archetypal force. It remains compelling in our own time. Faustian bargains are still made every day. Dr. Faustus represents a significant piece of theatre history, a gateway or transition between forms. Here, we've used the Edwin Morgan translation, a brilliant Scottish writer who transforms Marlowe's theme of magic into one of science. Another great Scotsman, Sir James George Fraser, posited that human belief progressed through three stages. Primitive magic, replaced by religion, in turn replaced by science. With Dr Faustus, we have all three in representation. The historical Johann Georg Faust, who died around 1539, was an itinerant alchemist and astrologer, and various legends developed around his supposed necromancy and pact with the devil. The sense of comic architecture within the Elizabethan stage is very strong in Faustus, and audiences responded to the transgressive trafficking in the demonic and the spectacle, theatrical or supernatural, this might produce. Another part of what makes Dr. F so compelling is its Janus-faced ambiguity. The complex and contradictory ways it presents its hero and his fateful bargain. Is it a parable about a justly damned sinner or a tragedy about a Promethean hero? Is it a satirical critique of a theological system that denies free will? The play does not have a singular theological perspective, and this is why, for a time, it made it onto the stage. An epigram of Oxford classicist R.M. Dawkins refers to Faustus as a Renaissance man who pays a medieval price. Ambiguity is also derived from the text itself. The aforementioned difficulties raised by the two texts are further compounded by uncertainties about the play's date. The first record of a performance is Philip Henslow's account book entry of 1594, more than a year after Marlowe's death. Dr. F inherits and exploits the dramaturgical traditions of the medieval and Tudor morality play. David Bevington's 1962 study says Dr. F reaches the end of the psychomachia drama tradition in a breakthrough which centres the familiar moral pattern on a figure of tragic dimensions. Douglas Cole also traced the play's morality roots, defining the ways it transcends them. The tragic protagonist in this play is a scholar, Dr. John Faustus, who, dissatisfied with the traditional disciplines, turns to magic. He repeatedly considers repenting and turning to God, but is unable to do so. There is sacrificial goat meat aplenty with the tragic destiny in this dialectic, the hero's choice to compromise one set of values for another. The comic scenes, long derided by scholars, are present in both versions and are clearly built in to the design of the play. They reflect and ballast the play's grander aspects. Isn't it a bit interesting that Marlowe is the only contemporary writer referred to in the Shakespeare works? In The Merry Wives, both Bardolph and Pistol reference Dr. F, suggesting Faustus was associated as much with comic mischief as with damnable magic, reflecting our capacity for ridiculousness and nobility in equal measure. Learning is my life. I must take stock of it. I have studied, graduated. I am Dr. Faustus. But what do gowns and parchments really tell us? What is my niche, my specialty, my dream? Philosophy? I once thought that would do the trick. By argument to tie an opponent in knots. By logic to prove black was really white. By speculation to pace the boundaries of being and non-being. Wonderful. I tried it. I knew it. I was there. So what? The earth went round just as before. Philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point 
is to change it. What about medicine? A cure for every sickness in the body. Dr. Faustus has it. The fame, the wealth. Who has not heard of my prescriptions, my precepts? Have I not sent plagues, packing, saved cities, wrestled some wretched maladies into the ground? Yes, and yes. But, but, we are still mortal. I am poor, Dr. Faustus, and a man. If I could make men live eternally, or if they died, give them a second life, then I could worship medicine. Without that, I say good riddance to pills and jabs and plasters. What next then? Law. There's a noble thing. Leave the same legacy to two different people and listen to the brains rattle. It'll cost you to know what happens. What happens? Oh, give one the gift, the other gets its value. Can you work that out? Isn't it brilliant? And can a father disinherit his son? No, no. Except, etc. <laughs> a world of petty fogging, petty disputes. A nest of inky fingered mercenary drudges. A quorum of slaves and superficial trash. Faustus was made for better things. Divinity. Surely divinity is good, better, best. Where is my Bible? My testament? Let's see. I open it at random for a sign. The wages of sin is death. Oh, that's hard. Let me try again, at a different place. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and there is no truth in us. So we sin, and so we die. Is that it? Is that all? Ah, but our death is an everlasting thing. Is that what you want, Faustus? Dying forever? Black book of intimidation. Black book of predestination. I close you with a snap. Farewell, theology. I think only science is truly divine. Physics and metaphysics both. Powers of prophecy, magic of imagination. Angles, equations, codes, experiments. Books of this restless age and ages to come. These are what I dream of and desire. Knowledge is the great prerogative of being human. Animals and nature are only sketches of the consciousness that man must reach and reap and revel in. An understanding of all things, a destiny. Oh, what a world of profit and delight of power, of honor, of omnipotence is promised to the learned experimenter. All things that move between the quiet poles shall be at my command. Emperors and kings may win obedience where their writ extends, but hurricane and lightning laugh at them. The scientist is king in his own land, which runs to the utmost grasp of the mind of man. Good scientists are gods. I'll be a god. That's the divinity I'll fix my brain on. Faustus initially appears seated at his desk, the iconic image of a scholar. In the B-Tech's title page illustration, he is surrounded by emblems of learning. Doctor of what? Medicine? Philosophy? That is not clear. Certainly Dr. D is conjured here, but someone else too. Faustus considers and rejects the diverse branches of medieval learning. Logic, represented by Aristotle, is the first to be rejected. The supernatural characters identified as the good and evil angels connect Dr. F to the medieval tradition. Too late. 
never too late if Faustus will repent. Repent? A devils will tear you to pieces! Repent, and they will never grace your skin. Yeah! Oh! Whilst the repeated dynamic of Faustus considering repentance but lured or bullied back into his path towards damnation creates gears for the tragic machinery to grind on, unstoppable, inevitable. I mouth my formulas like incantations. I know experiments are devilish dangerous, but I must risk what devil's line wait as I set out my table of the elements and circle round it, muttering, adjusting, invoking not the known, but the unknown. Deities of incandescent matter, spirits of most distant constellations, dogs for gods and rats for stars if need be. Unbelievable things shall be believed. Earth, air, water, fire, that's fine, but I must call to what's more elemental in the black crannies of the universe to gain the power I need. My help must come not from the Lord, he's useless and outmoded, but from a force and source so dark with danger. I cannot wait to welcome it. It's hellish close. Faustus' conjuring of Mephistopheles, Meph, provides a signature moment of demonic spectacle. but. With irony, when initially no devil arrives, and then he arrives too ugly. <laughs> Mef does not try to deceive Faustus like a morality play devil, but rather tells him the truth about hell to magnify his own willful self-deceit. Like Iago, Mef is the instrument, the space into which the protagonist pours his flaw or sin or weakness. Meff's gloating asides establish complicité with the audience and expose the protagonist's vulnerabilities. What would I not do to win his soul? Meff's weapon was supernatural theatricality, delighting Faustus and the audience, reinforcing an ongoing and perhaps ironic parallel between diablerie and theatre itself. This new meta-theatre was indeed able to bring spirits, like Helen of Troy, back to life. Tell me, what was all that about? Nothing, Faustus. A little interlude to show you the pleasures of your new power. All a bit of a sin, but oh boy, fun! Bruno is a significant addition in the B text, invoking the 12th century conflict between the popes and Emperor Frederick I. There is powerful symbolism and a strong statement in this staged intervention and rescue. We must help him. He is one of us. His head is like a star. I know his works. The play ends as it begins with a chorus. Cut is the branch that might have grown so straight. Burned is the laurel bough of genius that flourished once within this learned man. His story like a lightning flash invades the dark heart of complacency. And we who watch the darkness settle down once more. Remember, and will remember, those green thoughts that wait to break through stone where Faustus sleeps. This is the only epilogue in Marlowe's plays. It is identical in both texts in summing up the tragedy and expounding the lesson. The language suggests that Faustus is to be mourned as well as condemned. In 1952, Nicholas Brook concluded that Marlowe chose deliberately to use the morality form, but perversely, 
to invert it or at least satirise its normal intention. With bitter and farcical irony, Marlowe makes a magnificent protest against a cruel god. Or, for a more orthodox understanding, Michael Poirier, 1951, asserts that paradoxically, Marlowe achieves a result directly opposite to the one he aims at elsewhere. He strengthens the faith of his Christian audience. Stories are how we learn. They're a means to an end. In plays like Faustus, we find an enthusiasm for classical antiquity and exotic grandeur, apparently a hallmark of Marlowe's. But the knowledge, history, language, events and culture infused in the work is not here as a matter of mere show or to make a buck. It was to give people a language and to teach them how to be better in a time when there was a great need for this. This is how the RC was working, as with their manifestos, through a publicity stunt and attention-getting mystery. Has he a partner? Yes. No. Sometimes. Perhaps. Who knows? From mystery, power grows. Hereafter, sir, look you speak well of scholars. Talk about the iconic image of a scholar. Bacon was sent to Trinity College, Cambridge, at 12 to complete his education. Coincidentally, and with delightful irony, his dislike of the texts and methods, along with a confirmed hostility to the cult of Aristotle, meant that the world's greatest genius didn't graduate. He did, however, resolve to set philosophy on a more fertile path, away from scholastic disputation and towards illumination and the increase of human good, says Will Durant. Then three things happen. Eins, a supernova appears. Zwei, to the Lord Treasurer Burley, Bacon says, I have taken all knowledge to be my province i.e. he wishes to dedicate himself to exploring the unseen province of the mind. Bye. He adds proficiency, i.e. the practice, to Nicholas Bacon's idea of the advancement of learning. The RC called for a reformation of the whole wide world through the arts and sciences. Along with Dee, both fathers to Francis, Nicholas Bacon and Robert Dudley, were part of the UK branch. Dee had fascinating prophecies relating to Francis, believing he was a child of light, a spirit of liberty, science and love. He was Elias, the artist, as predicted by Paracelsus. Dee passed the lamp and leadership of the RC to Bacon. Francis had the foresight and the ability to steer the group and at the same time write under pen names reforming via a new style of English literature. The renovator of philosophy via comedy and tragedy, it was Providence that Bacon grew up on an estate which housed the ruins of the first Roman theatre in the UK, in Verulamium. The research of A. Staunch Baconian, from another Baconiana essay, traces Francis' interest in the motion, the technical Elizabethan term for the puppet show. One of the most successful motions in Germany from the end of the 16th century happened to be the English puppet play of Dr. Faustus. Hedewick says there is no drama except Marlowe's tragedy to which the origin of the puppet play can be traced. Dr. R. M. Theobald and the Rev. Walter Begley believe Francis St. Alban was the only dramatist, then alive and able, to birth both incarnations. We also know of Bacon's interest in the Dukes of Brunswick, whose strong castle on the Oka are mentioned in his States of Christendom. The Rosicrucian Dukes of Brunswick, ardent lovers of English playwrights and actors, as we know they were, were also lovers of the English tragedy of Faustus. Who made the additions after Marlowe's death is a mystery, but in Hedewick, among dramatizations of the Faust legend prior to the appearance of Goethe's Faust, is this. The tragical history of Dr. Faustus, 
printed for Thomas Bushel in 1604. Thomas Bushel? Francis Bacon's seal bearer and servant? The more recent work of A. Phoenix reveals that Francis wrote a play called Like Will to Like when he was just seven years old, a morality play which has as its central character Newfangle, the vice. From his early days up until his last, the subject of good and evil profoundly engaged Bacon's vast intellect. And along with the figure of the vice, it's no coincidence that this is clearly refracted through Dr. F and the Shakespeare plays, as we've seen with Mef and Iago. Intelligence at this time seems to conjure a rather dark underworld. And there was certainly a government cover-up concerning Marlowe's brutal death but there's an interesting point of connection with the talents of the university wits, like Marlow, who were employed in the Queen's business. Daphne du Maurier describes how Walsingham, a good friend of Nicholas Bacon's, organised a secret service on the continent, with Francis and his brother Anthony also being recruited for their literary and linguistic skills for intelligence and coding. In the 50s, Calvin Hoffman was offering thousands of pounds for any proof of Marlowe's being alive after his alleged murder in 1593. Without success, could have saved his cash and his pride. In the bilateral cipher of Sir Francis Bacon, Elizabeth Wells Gallup found a declaration of his that states... Marlowe is also a pen name, employed at taking William Shakespeare's as our mask or wizard. Rick Wagner asks, what's in a name? Why was this particular spelling or derivative of Marlowe chosen? Well, the name adds up to 33 in Pythagorean cipher. 33, Bacon's number. How easily Faustus may become a roadmap for Bacon. His learning experience, his passions, his conflicts. It's not Marlowe, but Bacon we find wrestling with this science-religion split in Dr. F. The science in Shakespeare is widely acknowledged. Bacon was a devout man of God, but also father to the modern scientific method. Fact. And who better to dispense the tragic wisdom than Francis, who understood that we can only know light through its opposite, devoted to his family's motto, mediocre firma, the middle way of harmony, peace and brotherhood. What now interests Simon Miles about the authorship issue is the meta aspect of the story. Why is Bacon rejected? Why do people cling to their Shakespeare? Why is the authorship issue so disjointed? Why is the problem so hard to crack? Bottom line, it was Francis that set it all up. Seems like he did too good a job. The more you come to know Bacon and comprehend his reach, you begin to realise you're simply not dealing with an ordinary human being. Es ist sehr mentalische. There is resistance to the authorship question because it might discount the possibility of the everyday English genius. But viewing the authorship story through our lens, we can still find a human and Elizabethan feat to be proud of, an even greater celebration of England. In a time when shows of cultural superiority were paramount, these works were created to make the country and indeed the world strong and great and awakened through time. In the magical and mystical vision of the RC, thought was free, and not just a way for elites to subjugate the many. As the playtext of Dr. F concludes with, Terminat hora diem, terminat orthoropus, terminat hora diem, terminat orthoropus, terminat hora diem. Terminat Terminat